privilege to be in the house of Almighty God. Amen? Despite the cold weather, you know what, the pandemic going on, so many things going on, so many different reasons to stay home. If it's too windy, we stay home. <laughs> if it's too hot, we stay home. If it rains, we stay home. If it's too cold, we stay home. We can come up with every excuse in the world to stay home. And sometimes, even in mega churches, when you look around and the seats are empty, they may hold 1,200 people, but when there's 400 people, it looks empty. And so sometimes it's discouraging. And as I look around and I see, of course, we're on Facebook Live, we're on YouTube, we greet all those that are viewing online. We know that some of you truly have sicknesses and you're staying home taking care of yourselves and your families. We're praying for you. Uh, if you need prayer, we've been going out to homes, doing home visitations. You can call the church's cell, the church's number. Call us, let us know you'd, you'd like prayer. We will come and visit with you, lay hands on you, and pray for you in the name of Jesus. Truly, if you have a sickness, we're here for you. That's what God has instructed us to do. But as I look around, I see so many empty seats. And I say, God, how am I supposed to preach and everybody's staying at home? I said, Google this morning, hey, Google, what's the temperature outside? And she said, 27 degrees. I said, oh, church is going to be empty today. <laughs> I told my wife, I get to wear this in Florida once a year, so here it is. But uh, I said, God, how do I preach when people are staying home? And he said, if you will be faithful and preach to the little that are there, because the ones that are there are the ones who are desperate for me. The ones that are in the house want more of me. And preach to them because he said, I, I have not forsaken them, and I care about them, and I will honor the sacrifice that you made. So I'm going to preach as though there were 5,000 people in here because that's what God instructed me to do. Amen. Praise God. This week, as I've been going through my devotion and, and prayer and uh, just asking God for wisdom, and he led me to the book of Matthew chapter 18, and I'll just share on that for a few moments so you all can get back to your fireplaces and hot chocolate. This Friday is our bonfire. We decide to move it under the pavilion, so in case it rains, in case it's wet, we're still going to have a good time. We'll have some live music, guitars, and uh, just come out and, and bring your sweaters, and we'll just have fun. As you all know, Brother Jesse's not with us today. Him and Christina got married on uh, Friday, I believe. Saturday. Saturday, yes. They tied the knot, praise God. And so we're so glad that God is using them in a mighty way. They, were, they got married out in St. Pete, uh, and uh, they're going to be traveling and just continue to pray that God will keep them. Amen. He loves this church, and uh, he says, Pastor, if I'm going to serve, I'm going to do things the right way. Amen. I'm going to be obedient to God. And I said, you know, you just listen to the voice of the Lord. Sometimes people come in these doors and we want them to dress a particular way. We want them to look a certain way. Let God do the fixing. We just welcome them and love on them and let God heal. Amen. Let God deliver. Let God take care of the rest of it. It's not our job to fix anybody. It's our God to be faithful our job to be faithful to the Lord. He says, don't look at the plank in your neighbor's eyes when you've got a log in your own eyes. Amen. We've all got things that we struggle and we deal with. Ask God to clean us from the inside out. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord's led me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. I welcome each and every one of you. Thank you for being here in the house of the Lord. And uh, as I read this this week, it just really, truly blessed my heart. And uh, I wish one wanted to share it. Uh, God, Father, as I come and I pray and I teach your word, Lord, let this word go out forth, Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, that those that are here today will hear your word, be receptive to your word, and go out and do what your word hath told us to do, Father God. We trust you, Lord. Thank you for those that are here today that are faithful, God. Lord, give them a double portion for the sacrifice they've made to be in your house. Lord, we do remember those that are sick and hurting, that you will heal and deliver them in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your hands that is, is upon their life right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. As I was reading this week, the word of the Lord reminded me uh, in the gospel, Jesus 
tells us that, that, that the women, the wives, are the weaker vessel. And Brother Tom Shoup is here today. He, he, uh, he opened up for us this morning, and he's doing a really tremendous work with the men on Mondays. If he's unable to be there, he makes sure that somebody steps up. Our outreach team is here, leaders, Pastor Jones and his beautiful wife, Pastor Ann. And uh, continue to pray for my wife. As you all, we told you all last week, uh, we've got one more on the way. We found out Monday was, it's a baby girl. So keep us in prayer. Praise God. <laughs> last and final one, amen. Uh, she said, let's try one more time. And uh, she really wanted a girl. And I said, just pray and, and have faith. You know, tell God what you want. You know, and, and at the end of the day, it's his will. It's his will. Leave it in his hands. I told you all last week, we went to... Uh, a few months ago, we were trying for a third baby, and uh, uh, we were in the parking lot, and there were no more parking spaces. And there was a, one parking space left that said, uh, parking for expectant mothers, mothers only. And I said, park right there. <laughs> she said, I'm not pregnant. I said, by faith, you're pregnant. <laughs> not only that, but I went to the store, and I bought a couple outfits and they were baby girl outfits. She said, how do you know it's a girl? I said, I'm having faith and I'm trusting God that you're going to get your baby girl. <laughs> Sometimes God, he, he says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have faith, but we've got to put actions to it. Faith is the evidence, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The disciple walked out. He didn't know that he would be able to walk on the water but he trusted God. But when he started to doubt, that's when he began to sink. But I'm asking all of you, men especially, the Bible says, the women submit to your husbands. Husband, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Amen? I'm encouraging the men to be the leader of the household. And these aren't my words. The Word of God says the women are the weaker vessel. I like being transparent. You all know that about me. Sometimes my wife and I argue, and I say, God, we just go back and forth, you know? And then God said, remember, the wife is the weaker vessel. Humble yourself and love her the way Christ loved the church. We didn't deserve to be loved. We are the ones that had sins, but Christ paid a debt that he didn't even owe. And I humble myself. Be the first to say, I'm sorry. Be the first to say, forgive me. Be the first to hold her hand at night and say, let's read the scripture. Brother Bob said this morning, him and his wife held hands and read the scripture. Hold the hand of your spouse and read the word and pray with her. Cleanse her with the word, the Bible says. And finally, hold her hand and say, baby, let's go to church. Let's go to church. I talk to a lot of ladies that say they wish their husbands would stand up, step up, and be a spiritual leader in the home. And I'm challenging you men to do so. Sometimes I try to do things and the men are telling me, let me get my, the permission of my wife to come to church. Let me get my wife's permission to read the word and God told me to remind the church, let the men step up and lead the home. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Matthew chapter 18, and I'm starting at verse 23. I don't know why, but the Lord has laid this, this text on my heart. It's the most popular theme in Christianity is forgiveness. <laughs> It gets quiet when we start talking about forgiveness, right? Amen. We don't want to talk about it. When I read the story in the Bible, of Act, in the book of Acts, where Stam, Sam, uh, Stephen mm -hmm. went out and started teaching and preaching and doing discipleship, yes. they brought him into the courts, the high priests, and he told them, ever since you were back in Israel, with the Israelites and the Egyptians and the Lord has brought you through so much. 
yet still you refuse the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And he said, you stiff-necked people, but he saw a vision of the Lord. And as he preached to them, they stoned him. When I thought that was the end, when they were stoning Stephen, I could only imagine picturing him being there, being persecuted by his own people for speaking life and speaking truth. And he said, Father, charge this not to them. Forgive them. And I said, how many of us, if we were stoned for preaching Jesus, would we say, forgive them? And so I want to talk about forgiveness, and I want to be brief this morning. Coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, and verse 23. As I did that wedding on Saturday, I talked about loving and forgiving one another, being the first to say I'm sorry, being the first to forgive. Let us make that a practice. The book of Matthew 18 and verse 23 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. In the next verse, please. We're getting some help, and we have some people trained back there in the media team, so thank you for your patience. <laughs> you can go on to the next section. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And if you look into that, 10,000 talents, pretty much he owed a debt that he couldn't pay because 10,000 talents would have taken him such a long time to repay it. Have you ever had such a debt that you said, how in the world am I going to pay this thing? whether it's financial or whatever the debt may be. When he had begun to sell accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before his Lord, saying to the master, please have patience with me. You ever said to the Lord, have patience with me? Lord, have patience with me. You owe the debt to somebody, please have patience with me. And I will pay you all of it. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. You believe that the Lord is moved with compassion towards us. For he so loved the world that he gave. Some people tell you, I love you. I'm with you. I'll do anything for you. But when you need them, they're nowhere to be found. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Can you go to verse 27? Then the master of servant was moved with compassion. He released him and forgave him the debt. You believe that God forgave us a debt that we owed. Now we belong to him. Verse 28, but that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants. And that servant owed him a hundred denarii, which was a small fraction of what he owed to his servant, his master. And he, he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. After he had just been forgiven 10,000, his servant owed 100. But he grabbed him by the throat, ready to choke him. That's right. Pay me what you owe me. I talked to this one guy, he said uh, he was married one time before, and he had a bunch of credit cards, <laughs> and he didn't know his wife was using all those credit cards. He said she ran up like $60,000 worth of credit card debt on, on his name, he didn't even know it. 
I said, your wife? He said, no, my ex-wife. <laughs> I bet he did grab her by the coat. He said, he said, I told her, I'm giving you one week to give me $60,000 or I'm going to shoot you. I said, really? He said, she had every dime by Friday of next week. I said, you're kidding. But this servant took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. He said, she said, she knew I meant business. I said, wow, you're tough. I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> he got his money. Verse 29 says, so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him the way he begged his master saying, please have patience with me and I will repay you. In verse 30, and he would not have patience with him. But he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, he said unto him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? Wouldn't that be the reasonable thing to do? Does anybody think that's unreasonable? But God is using this as an example to show us what the kingdom of heaven is like. Many times when he gave these parables, it was so the scribes and the Pharisees and all these other people wouldn't understand it. But he's trying to get us to understand what it's like being in the kingdom of heaven. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like one of these little children. And he took them and said, to humble ourselves as little children. And if any one of you offends these little children, it's better that a millstone be around your neck and you be thrown into the, to the, to the waters. And he said, should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant? And his master was very angry about what had been done and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And finally, verse 35 tells us, so my heavenly father also will do to each of you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Sometimes we don't even need to preach. The word of God will preach for itself. Right. Amen? Amen? Sometimes we just take one chapter, one verse, yeah. read it, pause, think about it, meditate on it, day and night, reflect on it, Ask God for the understanding, the wisdom. Sometimes I could read a, a chapter, two or three chapters, and, and I'm thinking, what did I just read? But sometimes I could read three verses and pause and say, God, what does that mean? Let me not read the word, but how can I apply this word to my life? I don't know what this word means to you this morning. But in order for our Father to forgive us, we have got to forgive others. Amen. I don't want the word of the Lord to say on the, on the judgment day, didn't I preach at Redemption Church? Even when nobody came, I was still preaching. <laughs> when it was cold and nobody came, I was preaching. We went out, we did outreach, we fed people, we prayed. And he says, depart, I never knew you. Didn't I prophesy in your name? Depart, I never knew you. All because we were unable to forgive. We accept God's grace and his mercy, but do we give that same grace and mercy to others? Do we give that same forgiveness? Because he said, if you cannot forgive, then I can't forgive you. Don't do good to just them that do good to you, even to your enemies, and pray for them. But in our text, in verse 23 of our text, 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts. The king was settling the accounts. Do you believe that God is holding us accountable? That is how the king was able to know that one of his servants owed him money because he was taking an account. And he realized that his servant owed him money. And this master in the story represents God. Because one day he is going to take an account. And we will have to answer for what we have done. Matthew 12 in verse 36 says, chapter 12 in verse 36, and Matthew says, Every idle word that men shall speak, every idle word that you shall speak, that you must give an account on the day of judgment. I like to put it up so you all can see it. There it is. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak that they will give an account of it on the day of, du on, of judgment. Sometimes I'm talking to people and it's easy to talk about somebody when they're not around. And sometimes I have to pause and say, God, forgive me, this isn't right. Because the word of God says if your bro brother has an oath against you, go to him right. privately Amen. and work it out. If you're at the altar standing and praying and you know things aren't right, go and fix it. So that the Lord can hear your prayers and answer your prayers. We can't love God who we don't see and hate our brothers who we do see. God said it doesn't work that way. By this you will know that you are my disciples, the love you have for one another. But we will have to give an account for every idle word. How many of us have to ask God for forgiveness for speaking some idle words at times? Things that make no sense. Things that are words to hurt somebody. To make somebody feel bad. What if that person was there listening to your conversation? Death and life lies in the power of our tongue. Our kids are committing suicide because of social bullying on the internet. Literally taking their lives because of what somebody said about them. People are turning to homosexuality because they feel that they don't belong anywhere. So maybe I can get some attention by loving the same sex. But instead of laughing at them, instead of criticizing them, you can be the light of Christ in that person's life. It doesn't end when we walk through these doors. When you walk through these doors, in my eyes, it's the beginning of your walk with Christ because now we get to go out and demonstrate what we do in here. Many times we come in here, we look nice, we put on a tie, we raise our hands and praise the Lord, and Monday morning we go to work and our co-workers don't even know that we belong to Jesus because we look like the world, we talk like the world. God says, be ye separate, be in the world but not of the world. Transform your mind. Some people may think you're crazy. When you're alone doesn't mean that you're away from God. Being with God means separation from the world. We have to be careful if the world loves us. We have to check ourselves because the word of God tells me that the world will hate you because you belong to Jesus. And they hated Jesus and they will hate you too. So if they love us, they love the way we talk and act. We have to look at our eyes, our, our, our lives through the word of Christ. Say, is my life lining up with the word of God? We all will be taken into accountability. Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. Romans 14 and verse 12. It says that, So then every one of us shall give a, an account of himself to God. Church, I no longer try to please man. I used to try to get man's approval. And you will run around crazy trying to get the approval of man because you'll do something and you'll offend somebody else. You'll do something and you'll offend somebody else and you're going around pretending and trying to be something that you're not. And I said, God, help me to be myself. 
Help me to love myself the way you created me because your word tells me that I am the apple of your eye. I don't have to live to please man because man will hail you today and nail you tomorrow. But God will be faithful to you until the very end. And he says, one day I will give an account not to my wife, not to brother Jimmy, not to brother uh, Steve. I'm going to give an account unto God. And he's going to say, what have you done with the time, the resources, and the life that I have given you? What have you done with it? He's going to take an account. When what are you going to say? How are you going to answer when he says, tell me why should I let you into my kingdom? What will you say? The book of Acts chapter 10 in verse 43 says, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will have Receive the remission of sins. If we believe, we will have received the remission of sin. Mark chapter 11 and verse 25 says, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, what do you do? I know the words are kind of small. If you have anything against anyone, what do you do? What do you do? Forgive him. Why? So that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. If you're standing and you're praying, and you know somebody's done something against you and you haven't forgiven them. He said you need to forgive so that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. I was doing a home visitation last week and I was just ministering to a couple. Brother Man was with me. We were having a good time. And she was telling me sometimes she has a hard time forgiving her husband. Because people do things that hurt us. The people that are close to us hurt us the most. Our very own people hurt us the most. Because when they hurt us, it hurts deep. And she said, the Lord reminded me the measure of grace and the measure of mercy and the measure of forgiveness that she has towards her husband is the same measure that God will have towards her. So if you've done something to me, if I want God to give me grace, I got to give you grace. If I want God to give me grace and mercy, I have to give you mercy. If, God, if I want God to forgive me, I have to forgive you. If I just give you, forgive you a little bit, then God will only forgive me a little bit. If I just have a little mercy towards you, God will have a little mercy towards me. If I give you a little bit of grace, God will give me a little bit of grace. Because the word is, God says, by the measure that you do these things is the same measure that God, the Lord will use towards you. I want to freely forgive. I want to let go of the grudges. I want to let go of the past. I want to have grace and mercy, not because that person is perfect, but because the Lord has been so good to me. And because I want God to have grace and mercy to me, I forgive you. I love you. In spite of the hurt, in spite of the pain, and most importantly, in spite of your reaction. Jesus said, if, you, if, you, if they smack you on one side, one cheek, turn the other cheek. If I go to Brother Bob and I give him something valuable, the next day I see it in the garbage. <laughs> that's, that's colder than 20 degrees. <laughs> that doesn't mean I stop loving him. I love him anyway. 
Because if we love people depending on their reaction, we'll never get the acknowledgement that we need, the recognition. We just do it because of the love of Christ in us. It's overflowing. I give you for you and I give to you because I want nothing in return. When I was working at my last job, I would do nice things for guys. And they would, they would think that because I did something that I wanted something from them. Because they were so used to that mentality. They said I was always trained to treat people the way you treated me. That's not what the Word of God says. You don't treat people the way they treat you. You love even your enemies. The Word of God says anybody can love somebody who loves you. The scribes and the Pharisees do that. But can you love somebody that hurts you? Can you love your enemy? Can you give something to somebody and have them not appreciate it and still go back and love them any, any way? Let me keep moving. The book of James chapter 5 and verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Some people think we have no power to save and heal the sick. I mean, we don't, God does, but through us. He says, greater things you will do than these, than what Christ did. These signs will follow them that believe. You will lay hands on the sick. He told them, go make disciples, and those disciples made disciples, and they kept on going. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Through the prayer of faith. And he says, confess your trespasses one to another. It's okay to say sorry. Sometimes pride gets in the way and we can't say I'm sorry. We know we did wrong. I've talked to people and they said, they know people who hurt them. They just cannot say I am sorry. It is so hard to say I'm sorry. Can we all just say that right now? Just say I'm sorry. Let's practice that. Say I'm sorry. One more time. <laughs> Tell the person next to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Didn't that feel good? Can we give God a hand of praise this morning? Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Anybody need healing? You know somebody needs healing? Confess. Look at, isn't that amazing what the, the, the prerequisite to healing is? Confess your trespasses one to another. Some people are sick and they don't know why they can't be healed. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Some people are sick and they can't get over it because they can't say, I'm sorry. They can't say, I forgive you. Come on, this is the word of God. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The word of God says that he hears the cry of the righteous. If you belong to God and you walk in his ways, the righteous steps, that are, or the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, he will hear your prayer. He will hear your cry. The book of Ephesians 4, 32 be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. Not the heart of a stone, but the heart of a flesh. Tender-hearted. Be kind. I love that verse in, the, in the, the New Testament that says, Husbands, don't be harsh with your wives. We do that so many times. Your wife is like your best friend, right? Sometimes you get into it, but he says, don't be harsh. Be tender-hearted. I don't know why he didn't say, wives, be tenderhearted to your husband, but. <laughs> I can't say the word God says that because it doesn't. It doesn't say, wives, be tenderhearted to your husband. You take that up with the Lord. But he does say, husbands, don't be harsh with your wives. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Matthew 6, verse 14 says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I'm going to ask Israel to come. And I just got one more scripture, and that's coming from Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, and it says, For with what judgment you judge. You know anybody that likes to judge people? <laughs> Look at what he's wearing. Look at what she's wearing. Why did she say that? Why did they do this? We start judging everybody. Sometimes I, I, I go and I minister to the, to the world. You know, I, I talk to people that are unsaved. I, I like to talk to people that are not Christians. You know, Jesus spent time with those people. And they criticize him. Look at him over there hanging out with sinners. He said, I didn't call to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is the sick that needs a doctor. When we're feeling 100% and we can jump and run and skip, I don't say, doctor, check me out. But it's when I'm sick and I'm coughing and I can't breathe and I need some kind of healing, I go to the doctor and say, I need something. God said, those are the people I've come for, the sick that need a doctor. We're so quick to judge people. And I talk to the people in the world and I say, how come you don't go to church? Well, I don't think you need to go to church to be saved. And I said, yeah, that's true. But what's your relationship with him? Do you read the word? Do you pray? Do you spend time with the Father? And they say, you know, Christians are just such the, the most judgmental people I have ever met. And I want to say I disagree, but it's almost like I can't. <laughs> I mean, that's what Jesus had to deal with, the scribes and the Pharisees, constantly. But the judgment you judge, you will be judged. If you like casting judgment on others, as the preacher said last week, Jesus was the only one who had the right to take that stone and cast it at the woman caught in the act of adultery. He was the only one that had the right to do that. Yet he said, go... Where are your, 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 your accusers? I, I go and sin no more, neither do I condemn you. The judgment you use to others is the same judgment that's going to come back to us. And with the measure you use, somebody say that, with the measure. Some people might be measuring in gallons or, or tons or centimeters. Whatever measure you use is the same measure that's going to come back to you. It will be measured back to you. Will you stand to your feet this morning, church? As you raise your hands and stretch to heaven, we're getting ready to go home. Continue to surrender to his will. Tell the Lord what's on your heart this morning. Think about that situation that's hard to forgive, that's hard to say, I'm sorry. Jesus.